uh, Finola, uh, a 10 country report from APF, the right to dissent must be at the heart of democracies, reveals that democratically elected leaders are consistently disregarding the rule of law when it comes to enforcing their own agendas. Institutions, including the judiciary, the police, the bureaucracy, who are meant to safeguard constitutionally provided rights, endorse regime or government interests. Uh, the sharpest attacks ranging from direct force to the use of draconian laws are on dissent and the dissenter who stand between the government and naked repression. Governments posit dissent as anti-national and thereby extern it from the frame of the nation state. In your wide experience, how do we best respond to this vice, widespread disregard for the rule of law? How can international law make a difference? And can citizens use international law to protect their rights? So thank you. And just also to acknowledge the importance of the report and the conversation about the ways in which both democracy is under extraordinary threat um, and the ways in which those who actually are in some ways the defenders of democracy through dissent are themselves under threat. And I think we see those patterns ubiquitously across the globe. We see civic space um, under enormous pressure, being constrained, shackled, uh, marginalized, um, oppressed, um, often not only disregarded, but, but in fact separated out for heightened scrutiny, heightened regulation. Um, and at the heart of that too are the individuals who make up civic society, those who speak out, those who exercise their fundamentally protected rights under international law to assemble, to speak, to participate in public affairs. Um, and I think it's important to note that increasingly see, we see women dissenters as under particular stress, women human rights defenders, for example, as not only being targeted, but being killed and eliminated across the globe simply for speaking about the rights of women. So I think we're all deeply aware of the, the gravity and the scope and the scale of this attack on, uh, on, the, on the idea of speaking out, on the practice of speaking out, on the practice of simply disagreeing with government. And um, how do we respond? Well, I think the first way we respond is actually naming the phenomenon. And I think that naming and that, that surfacing of, of not just that these are not just individual attacks on individuals, but that there's a concerted and sustained assault on dissent is the starting point. And the second is, I think, to acknowledge the genuine and extraordinary pressure that individuals face and the solidarity and support that we need to give those individuals engaged in the process of dissenting. Because as many of us know, the, the harm, the, the fear, the isolation, the vulnerability of being a dissenter, uh, and particularly a female dissenter, is just quite extraordinary on that person and on their family members. So solidarity and practical assistance, including def defending those dissenters, whether that's legally or offering them safe spaces or protect, speaking on their behalf when they are not able to protect themselves is critical. And the third is, of course, using our global system and calling on states to do better. And that's hard because, of course, one of the paradoxes here is that democracies themselves, who are, in theory, the sine qua non of the defense of the dissent, are engaged in these practices themselves. And my view is that we actually have to find, not only do we have to expose the hollowness of democracies engaged in patterns of authoritarianism, but we also have to find new allies. Um, our friends are not always our friends in these spaces. And so understanding that building new alliances with each other, but also with other states, with other stakeholders, I think is gonna be critical. Um, yes, uh, Lawyers Rights uh, Watch uh, in Canada in their uh, Right to Dissent report argues 
that uh, the guarantee of the right to dissent and to participate in peaceful protest is not found in a, any single formulated right in international law, but rather is firmly anchored in a number of distinct but interconnected and mutually enforcing fundamental rights. Now, do you feel that this is the right time for the UN and other multilateral bodies to take up this issue at the highest level and consider passing an appropriate international law that would focus on the right to dissent? So I think there's the ideal world and there's the world in which we live pragmatically and work with states. So I think the view that the right to dissent is, a, is an interconnected right that spans a set of different uh, manifestations or elements of that right from expression to assembly to participation in public affairs, for example, uh, to non-discrimination. The idea of non-discrimination is essential to the right um, to dissent. I think that view is broadly correct. It's sort of an umbrella of rights that supports the idea of dissent. But I have to confess that I remain very skeptical of our capacity to move states to articulate new and meaningful rights in this area. Uh, the reason is, is that it's not in states' interests to protect rights that they are in the process of undermining. Um, and more than that, it, it makes me nervous in the sense that what we have seen is that when states have the opportunity to revisit fundamental rights, that they often seize that opportunity to actually further weaken and undermine the right. So the, the functional assumption that in a universe where this right, this, this umbrella right is under assault, that states will be convinced that they ought to in fact elevate and, and promote that right in a more sustained and, and, and straightforward way, I think runs some extraordinary risks. Now that doesn't mean that it's not worth having the agitational conversation of demanding the kind of protection that a singular right would 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 um, deliver but it does seem to me that there are risks and um, my own strategy as special rapporteur has always been to first of all really focus on holding states to what they have agreed to states have entered into contracts in existing treaty law those are long and established, and many of them constitute customary international law. So there isn't a basis to claim really for states that these things are not rights. And so my view is we need to hold them firmly and undulatingly to those commitments and expose the kind of paucity and poverty of their failures to implement them. And I also feel that one of our biggest strategies is to make coalition with one another, to recognize that in various parts of the globe, these aren't country specific problems. These are problems being experienced by multiple democracies as well as multiple authoritarian spaces. And that we have commonality with each other across different kinds of movements from the environmental movement to the women's rights movement to the rights socioeconomic rights movement to the disability rights movement that actually as a as a global community of rights bearers and rights claimers we have to find ways to actually push back together and not be fractured not allow them to make division between us and in some ways i would take the view that our energies are best crafted in coalition building and and delivering on the rights that states have agreed to rather than pushing enormous energy into trying to get states to agree new rights, which they may not enforce either. I think you've preempted uh, my next two questions, really. But um, all of us at APF and other uh, social movements, we felt that uh, maybe a wide coalition of civil society with support from human rights um, and social rights organizations, international lawyers, uh, could at least be an appropriate way of consolidating and um, strengthening international public opinion on this right at this critical uh, moment where uh, there's so much at stake. What do you feel about that? So I'm an extraordinary believer in coalitions. I mean, I, I grew up in Belfast um, through the conflict and many of the ways in which the civil society that I have been a part of for most of my adult life there 
function to hold the state and non-state actors accountable was actually by working in concert, by actually delving into relationship building, strong partnerships across very diverse groups. And I think, so, so for me, that idea of connection, which I think is all the more emotionally significant now in time of COVID, where we feel so isolated from one another, where both the, the idea of connection and community has been so elusive for so many over the past year. And I think that it's all it has more meaning and substance, I think, for many in, in, a, in a really felt way now than than perhaps before. Um, but I also recognize and I, I see it in the area I work in, which is counterterrorism and human rights as a special rapporteur, that one of the ways we've been most successful is to build coalitions of classic non-governmental organizations with humanitarians, with the women's rights, women, peace and security agenda, um, with um, other groups, environmentalists um, and others who've been targeted by security laws across, across the globe. Um, and I think, well, what does it mean to build that kind of coalition? It means that we sometimes have to compromise. It means that we won't all get our agendas delivered in exactly the way we would build them if we were in our own little silo and not trying to make coalition with others. It will require compromise. It will also require, I think particularly true of um, movements in the global north, creating space for and listening to our partners and um, and fellow travelers in the global south, because many of the challenges here is the kind of outsized voice of those who are in some sense less constrained, less harmed, less uh, uh, who, uh, who, who occupy a lot of space in coalition building. And so it is coalition building is about creating space. Um, and it's also about recognizing that it's really hard and really slow and requires constant tending. And I think one of the challenges for us historically has been that we love the idea of that connection, but the kind of work that it requires to maintain it and grow it and 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 sustain it is really hard work. It's really it's it work it's work of tending to relationship and tending to solidarity because that, those things don't happen without meaningful ongoing relationships. So. I think the question is less, should we be doing this work of coalition building, to which the obvious answer, of course, when states are banding together to crack down on dissent, because this isn't happening in isolation, is that we have to speak back in one voice against that. But the harder work is the how, the how of how we do it, and the, the necessary compromise and work and tending that comes with that. And I think that's our challenge, not the conceptualization of solidarity and, and, and cooperative work to do this, to advance these ideals. Um, you're absolutely right. And at this time where there's so many um, different uh, existential issues from climate to social justice, uh, do you have, um, I mean, I, what I want to ask you is, what actions can a coalition like this uh, prioritize? I know uh, intersectionality is important, et cetera, but um, how would you suggest, you know, the kind of experience and insights you have, how do we move towards this? So I do, I mean, there's no magic bullet. This is all hard work and it's never, roll, you know, it's never built in a day. For me personally, in, in, the, in the work that I have done, I think connection, rele relevant, regular connection is really significant. You can't coalition build unless you're in constant dialogue. And so one of the advantages in some ways that the digital space that we are in this conversation across space and time in today, and I've seen it in my work as special rapporteur, is we've been able to convene you know, large groups of people online. And when we've tried to do that in terms of getting on planes, not only pre previously, not only were we damaging the environment, but often there were people who simply couldn't get there. So I do think that one of the sort of 
the, the seizure moments we have here is actually the capacity to gather groups with all of the constraints that the digital media we're working on gives us to bring more people into dialogue together. So that's the first thing is actually to, in a positive way, exploit the opportunities created by digital space to bring more of this north, south, east, west connectivity together. Um, and the, the one piece of that I think that requires tending or minding is to recognize the privilege that comes with having digital space and, and not only the technology, but functional internet and time to be in digital space. And I think understanding that, for example, we may have to create means to compensate our fellow uh, uh, civil society actors who, who, who don't have full time, who don't have the time to spend a day online because they're earning a living in order to be in solidarity with us. We have to think about those very practical things of compensation, understanding who has access and who doesn't and remedying those deficits. I think the other thing I would say is that we need it regularly. You know, I think one of the things we've all learned, we certainly learned it in the women's human rights movement, is that we need constant engagement. And that's tiring. People will say, I've had too many Zoom calls today. I, I don't wanna have another conversation. But there is a rigor to regularity that I think we need to understand in order to build. Because on the other side, let's be clear, states uh, are meeting regularly to advance agendas that function to undermine the values of dissent and open society across the globe and they're being supported and enabled in that enabled in that by multiple cooperative mechanisms so in some sense we have to internalize that and and respond to it in in a way and i think the other piece that that is really important here is the sort of understanding that we're on a really long road i mean those of us who've been engaged in human rights for a long time know this is not a short-term proposition and um, and understanding that that long road means that the fights are long, the the, the costs of that for individuals are, are long, and that actually we have to pace ourselves and be supportive of each other, recognizing that actually the work is really hard. And it's a little bit it's the Sisyphean image that always stays with me is that we are we're always pushing rocks up mountains and then we often stand at the top after years of work and watch the rock roll away and we go back down and we pick it up and we start again and that's the metaphor for so much human rights work the defense of of the kind of fundamental dignities that make life bearable and livable as as a, as a human being and so i think it's the understanding of the long haul that's really important also for solidarity building that it's not transient that i think has to be practiced and understood in the way we do our work uh, thank you, uh, Finula, for being part of uh, AEPF 13. It was a privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really, really glad to be here. The same. Really glad. Wish I was there in person, but <laughs> we'll be, that'll be a while. <laughs> next time. Yeah, next time. I know. Thank We're hoping you. to actually, oddly enough, the, the mandate, we're back on the road. My team are all... Um, with one exception, we're all vaccinated, um, which is extraordinary, partly because I'm in the US. If I were in Ireland, I wouldn't have been, been vaccinated yet, but we are vaccinated. So we are gonna be in Singapore in July for a week, and then we're gonna be in Thailand for uh, another week. So we're gonna do a, a, a regional visit. Um, so the week to Singapore is a country visit, but the week in Thailand is just gonna, is a